Welcome. Good morning. We're going to get started. Uh, we're already a few minutes behind, but we're going to get started. My name is Spencer Brimley. I've been asked to introduce our panel this morning uh, for the uh, Think Regionally, Implement Locally, uh, an example from South Salt Lake in their East Streetcar District. I am going to, uh, I don't like to do this, but read a little bit about each of our presenters just to give you an idea of who they are. I know them individually, but uh, they've done some cool things that I want to make sure you guys are aware of. So Julia Collins is a pro program manager for Wasatch Front Regional Council. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Julia is the program manager for, for the Transportation and Land Use Connection Program at Wasatch Front Regional Council. Um, this program provides regional perspective through grants and pro project assistance to local governments with challenging challenges involving land use, economic development, and transportation planning. Julia's recent accomplishments include leading downtown Clearfield City Plan. I work for Clearfield City, so there's a little bit of bias there, so we appreciate the opportunity to speak about that. Uh, West Centerville Neighborhood Plan. Prior to joining Wasatch Front Regional Council, Julia worked for True Partners Consulting in Chicago, specializing in securing state and local economic development incentives. Julia holds a master's in city and metropolitan planning from the University of Utah and a bachelor's degree from Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Julia is an avid mountain biker and serves as a planning commissioner for Summit County. And welcome, Julia. Wonderful. Uh, Mr. Francis Xavier Lilly uh, is the Housing Administrator and Deputy Director of Community Development for South Salt Lake. Um, Mr. Lilly, let's see here, participated on the committee that oversaw the development of the temple, template form-based code as part of the Wasatch Choice for 2040 initiative and worked with colleagues in calibrating the template. Wow, Frank, you put a lot of big words in this. Man, it's making it difficult for me for the South Salt Lake's East Streetcar Corridor in downtown. Francis also serves as the city's housing administrator. His responsibilities include managing the city's community development block grant allocations, which are currently being used to fund a neighborhood revitalization campaign and a number of other initiatives to encourage long-term residency in South Salt Lake. Francis obtained a bachelor's of science in urban planning and a master's in public administration, both from the University of Utah. Welcome, Mr. Lilly. Justin Earle is the Director of Acquisition and Development at ICO. Um, and if you're not familiar with ICO, it's, it's Ivory's commercial development arm. He is also an adjunct professor at the David Eccles School of Business. He has a primary responsibility to implement the growth and development objectives of ICO development <clears throat> in commercial real estate product types, retail office, industrial, and in student housing. Justin's real estate experience includes acquisitions, development, property management, leasing, and underwriting. Prior to joining ICO, Justin worked as a financial analyst and underwriter with Phillips Edison and Company, the largest private owner of grocery anchored shopping centers in the country with 27 million square feet and 250 plus shopping centers in approximately 37 states. Justin has a master's degree in real estate development from the University of Utah um, and a master's degree in finance from the University of Utah and a bachelor's degree in fine arts from Brigham Young University. So with that, let's welcome our panel today for our discussion. Thank you, Spencer, and thanks to all of you for this opportunity to talk about some of the great things that South Salt Lake has done. Um, it's our intention today to share with you how we get from this Wasatch Choice vision that Andrew, Mayor McAdams spoke about. How do we get from these big picture ideas to down to the level where it's actually implemented, built, and create on the ground? So we're here um, to highlight South Salt Lake as one of the many communities along the Wasatch Front that's really taking the bull by the horns and um, moving forward with bringing this vision to South Salt Lake. So, but before we dive into this presentation, I think it would be helpful for us um, to understand more about you and your perspectives. So maybe just by a show of hands, we could see who's here representing um, a local government. You're a city staff, you're elected official, you're a planning commissioner. Who, excellent. So the perspective, that, that's great. Um, what about like maybe the private sector, consultants, business communities? Perfect. And you're here because you're really interested and you represent something awesome. Great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, that's really helpful. Thank you. So uh, I work for Wasatch Front Regional Council. Uh, we are one of the regional agencies um, that's a steward of the Wasatch Choice 2040. And um, as we learned, this vision 
is critical in how we address the population growth that our region is going to face by 2050. And you know, we're launching 20, Wasatch Choice 2050, but just to remind you, this is the 2040 vision map that was created back in the day. I'll give us a little history lesson on how we got to here today. But it's a centers-based vision. It provides options for transportation, options for lifestyle, options for housing. It really provides a holistic approach to ensuring that the quality of life that we have now will enjoy in the future. So we all know these plans and these places are extremely difficult to create. And actually, that's how I got here today. So I was in school, I had a master's degree up at the University of Utah, I think in 2007. Andrew Gruber, the executive director of Wasa Wasatch Front Regional Council, came to our classroom. And he presented on this vision. And he said, this is why we need this. We need this. We're working towards this. Our region has adopted these principles. And I raised my hand and said, that's all great. A vision. Nice job. OK. How are you actually going to get there? Because these places are so hard to create. You need, a, I mean, everyone needs to be working together to collaborate all the way down from that region down to the bottom. And so we're going to demonstrate today how South Salt Lake has taken that, how Wasatch Front Regional Council, how Salt Lake County, how UTA, UDOT, even the Morgan Weaver Health Department, we've all come together to support local governments, you as citizens, the business communities, so that we can all move together and provide those types of options. And we went over this a little bit um, in the previous discussions, I think that really set the foundation, that there's so many benefits to centers. These are just a couple of them, you know, putting a, mixed, a mix of uses in close proximity, that enables, as a participant, walking throughout those environments, I can get there without having to get in my car. It's interesting, it's exciting, it's a place that I want to be in. The benefits to housing, the benefits to transportation, providing lower costs with building in a more centered like development. There, these are, like I said, these are just a couple of them, but they're good things for us to think about as we really change the shift. We have a paradigm shift in the way in which we construct our built environment. So, backing up. In 1997, led by Envision Utah, a lot of regional agencies grassroots vision to build this Wasatch Choice. And we developed that vision. So then, fast forward again to 2011, still many agencies, many partners, all involved in thinking about how do we implement this? How do we, how do we get this moving? How do we get this on the ground? And Due to the collaboration, due to the visionary collaboration, um, many agencies applied for a Sustainable Communities Initiative grant. And this was to develop tools, to develop policies, to support local governments um, in thinking about how we are going to move forward with implementing this vision. So this is a list of some of the tools that were created. Um, the reason why I'm highlighting this is ultimately the tool that South Salt Lake used was um, the form-based code template that came out of this. So the form-based code template, which uh, Frank will talk about a little bit more in, in depth, but the, I, there's a big hurdle with thinking more about design and form and shifting some of the emphasis off of use um, in graphics, in time, in the calibration. And this particular document, uh, the team spent the time to calibrate the graphics, to set up a platform, to set up a process. Um, and that really takes a lot of the initial burden off of a community that's thinking about exploring these things. And to kind of ignite your, uh, your interest and to kind of be a steward of some of the information that we're presenting to you today, we're creating more training opportunities. So form-based codes, it's a different way of thinking about policy and ordinance governing land use. And more emphasis on design and the impact that a design can have on walkability, on transportation choices, on housing choices. And so this is the first of these type of opportunities. There's a flyer going around. It's free. Did I mention that it's free? It's free. So um, <laughs> bring your planning commissioners, bring your city council, bring your elected officials, invite your neighbors. Um, the idea is that, again, we're talking about the regional vision. 
we're going to address how you can uh, bring that to your community and then um, kind of get more into the details on how you're going to calibrate that. Um, and we'll have some experts on hand that uh, know a lot about urban design and form-based codes. So September 29th in Davis County in Farmington City Hall, um, mark your calendars. So what we did after 2014, sorry, back to our history, history lesson, of creating these tools. So now we have this toolbox. What do, what do we do with this toolbox? How do, how do we get that to people that are going to use it? How do we disseminate and incentivize this? So Wasatch Front Regional Council uh, was part of the initial partnership, but the questions were asked, how do we incentivize these tools? How do we incentivize the vision? How do we support local communities? Because these places are so challenging to create, and these obstacles uh, can be quite big. And due to the innovative leadership, a partnership, the partnership continued and it was born. Something called the Transportation Land Use Connection, um, just one of the many different mechanisms to support, support uh, the future we choose and the Wasatch Choice 2040. But um, Transportation Land Use Connection is a grant program with a whole host of different uh, partners. So we have Wasatch Front Regional Council, Salt Lake County, UTA, UDOT, um, and the Weber Morgan Health Department. And this partnership has brought together funds, so grant funds, um, technical assistance, to really think about how can we um, support local governments that are kind of grappling with these issues. So it's beautiful timing, um, and being stewards of the vision and supporting local governments. And this is along the Wasatch Front. Um, we have six counties where, that are eligible for this funding. We have $900,000 annually that we program. And I'll get more into the details of what's eligible, what type of projects are eligible, how local governments can utilize this funding. But the goals really um, parallel well with the, the goals of the Wasatch Choice 2040. So to help local governments, I think that's really the, the number one goal um, from the regional perspective down to, that lo to the local governments. Think about how you can foster growth in centers, how you can provide these options and choices, how we can support the Wasatch Choice 2040, um, the growth principles and the tools that were developed, and now it's the Wasatch 2050. Reduce travel demand. As we learned earlier, um, health, Active transportation, providing different choices, not only has an impact on our health, but the built environment is directly correlated to that. So providing choices that not only increase our quality of life, um, our health, and our community's health. And to provide technical assistance to support local communities, whether it be in terms of money or staff time, um, but to really advance um, with these types of challenging planning projects to promote collaboration because as we learn, what happens in city X can directly affect city Y. So if we're thinking about how we t together can collaborate and advance and move together, we're not competing with each other, instead we're working together and building on each other's strengths. And that also goes with at the local level and the regional level too. So what types of projects, I know you're thinking, you're brainstorming, man, I've got all these challenges where I live, where I work, my community, and really, the sky's the limit in terms of planning because we have to plan, we have to have a blueprint. We need to, to have a vision. We already have the regional vision, but bringing it down to the local level. So this is a list for you, but it, we're not limited to this list. Transportation corridors, thinking about holistically a transportation approach. Market studies, what exactly will the market bear in my community? Active transportation master plans. Let's promote all the different types of development, all the different types of transportation choices. Training on those tools. First last mile implementation. How important it is to get to your transit locations, not just by driving. Um, thinking about, as we'll learn with South Salt Lake, kind of a holistic approach from vision to implementation with the ordinance, understanding the market, and comprehensively, taking a implementation approach to how you're going to bring about change in your community. So I've given you a snapshot of our program. Um, this is a resource so you can learn more. And we're moving into our fourth year of the program. 
Um, we do have 900,000 annually. It's a partnership with Salt Lake County. The website is hosted at Wasatch Front Regional Council. Um, to date, we've funded 36 projects. So this is just a sampling of one. Um, these projects are exciting. Again, making change, supporting local governments with these concerns. And um, we have an interactive website, so you can actually pull up the entire Wasatch Front and click on um, the location and learn about each of the projects, so when you're brainstorming ideas. So um, just a little snapshot of, of the support that we gave South Salt Lake before I hand it over to Frank. Um, this award was in 2014, when we first started the program. And this, the staff of South Salt Lake were so creative in their approach that $25,000, this is not a typical, I mean, it's a very small amount of money that made a huge impact in South Salt Lake. So um, pr it promoted transit-oriented development, it promoted high-quality development, and that amount of money just made a really big impact. And so $900,000, we can make it stretch and it'll go a very long way. So um, I'm gonna hand the time over to Frank to talk more about uh, what exactly happened. <laughs> Good morning, and uh, thanks for uh, thanks for coming today, and uh, thanks to you know everybody who um, all the players who sponsored this great event, and I'm really privileged to um, share our city story um, because we think that it's it, it's it's a model, particularly for um, you know smaller suburbs to um, to accomplish uh, a wide uh, a long term vision. Um, you know, Julie, you made it sound so easy, but um, one of the things that I want to convey through the, through, the, through the next several slides is it's not like we woke up one day and said, let's go plan a center. Um, we didn't, and, and it's actually, you know, the effort of, of, you know, several years worth of planning and citizen engagement and um, analysis with property owners and uh, a number of other uh, folks who are actually sitting in this room uh, that made this possible. Um, but on the other hand, there was no way that we, as a small city with big city problems, big city infrastructure, and big city demands, could have produced a form based code like this on our own. Um, and that's really where the transportation and land use connection can be of help to you um, as you as you consider these uh, consider these projects. We um, we found that as a, we found it as a great way to leverage limited staff time, limited staff expertise, with nonetheless a very strong vision to um, get and adopt a form based code in a shockingly short amount of time. <laughs> um, so just I, I want to spend the next few minutes just kind of talking about giving you a little bit of context for the uh, the neighborhood in which we operated, because it really tells the story and it and it and it, and it also kind of exp it also kind of explains why we chose the template and the form based code model um, as a solution to um, to 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 leverage this opportunity that we found ourselves having in our community because of the streetcar. Um, this map shows the former zoning overlaid by the uh, the what's now the the actual district boundary of the East Streetcar corridor, and you can see um, in traditional planner yellow, um, you know this neighborhood is surrounded by or the corridor is surrounded by existing single family homes. These single family homes are uh, some of the best maintained, some of the most traditional in our community. They range from pre-war bungalows to mid-century modern. Um, this is a very actively engaged uh, neighborhood in our community. And um, to not to put too fine a point on it, when they heard that the streetcar was coming through several years ago, they melted down. Um, because it, it, it represented a, a really kind of significant tectonic shift in, in, uh, in the community. Now, along the corridor were a number of um, a, n a number of historic industrial uses, um, as it was a historic rail corridor. There were there was also a large multifamily project that um, had become something of a black beast in the neighborhood. Um, a bete noir. It, it was a problem. Um, it was a source of significant um, 
uh, significant community outrage and the perception that there was a that that there was a um, that it, w it wasn't serving its residents well and it wasn't serving the neighborhood well. That was the context under which we as planners said, hey, how do you feel about no density and lots more apartments? Um, so one of the reasons why f the form-based code was, was, uh, w was utilized is because the, the neighborhood, in the end, it, became, it came down to an issue of design and compatibility. You know, how do you... Uh, how do you incorporate, you know, densities that are demanded by the property values and the proximity to rail lines in a manner that's compatible with the surrounding neighborhood? Um, and once residents understood that the uses in question would be predominantly residential, it became apparent that form itself, how these buildings worked, how the sites worked together, was the biggest concern. And the template form-based code that was developed as part of the Wasatch Choice 2040 initiative did provide us with a toolkit to address building form and open space considerations on a block-by-block -block basis. I can't emphasize that enough, right? The form-based code is, allows you to take a really, a really granular site-specific approach to zoning. Um, for that reason, it might not be the solution for your entire city or for every neighborhood in the city. But in this case, it worked really, really well. This is actually the first of two form-based codes that we've developed off of the, off of the template. Um, the second which, uh, of which uh, encompasses our downtown, or what will become our downtown area, and we were able to do such things as incorporate a standard for residential buildings within 500 feet of major arterials and the highway such that uh, they have to um, uh, adopt a uh, HVAC standard to, to screen near area pollutants. That's the type of thing that a form-based code can, can, can actually accomplish in your, in, in your neighborhoods. And the reason why I bring that up is because we're talking about the intersections today of land use policy and public health. Um, on one hand, it's seen as kind of an innovative approach, but on the other hand, it's really a return to form for you know, what, what the purpose of, of land use planning was originally intended to do, and that was to solve public health problems. Um, a form-based code provides more certainty in terms of design than a traditional zoning ordinance, which, and that certainty gave our elected officials the confidence that they could relinquish controls over approval of specific projects. And uh, Justin Earl will explain to you why that was advantageous for them. Um, a form-based code also allows us to calibrate design standards to our broader general plan and economic development goals, which we discussed over several years in the uh, creation of this East Streetcar Corridor neighborhood. Um, so we started with uh, building community support for a specific transit type. There was a question many years ago over whether this corridor would be a light rail corridor or a traditional streetcar corridor. One of the things that South Salt Lake helped accomplish was moving the needle towards streetcar. Um, we were initially afraid that the corridor wouldn't necessarily serve South Salt Lake residents. Uh, as long as it were a relatively fast-moving light rail um, corridor. We also needed to um, define and understand South Salt Lake City's role in a regional vision, um, and we used the quality growth strategy in Wasatch Choice 2040 to inform our general plan efforts and our outreach efforts to the residents to say, yeah, this is actually a very good thing for the community. It will help you. It will provide you with uh, more choice in terms of transit and walkability than you've ever had before. It's going to connect this neighborhood to Sugar House in a way that's never been connected before. What a great idea. Now you can ride your bike up to uh, Sugar House Park without dying on the way. That's a great thing. <laughs> and, and, the neighborhood, and the neighborhood began to, to, to buy this and see, and see the value in that. Um, we also defined a broad vision for mixed-use, higher-density development done carefully to preserve existing single-family neighborhoods. So we created, we established the framework by creating citywide design standards that acknowledge that yes, we are a uh, center for transit-oriented development, but we deserve the best and only the best. And so we started with a citywide design standard for all multifamily projects that helped inform um, our standards for the form-based code. We also, of course, worked with our partners, and we developed a citywide housing strategy. So three specific things informed the creation of this code. First off, we did a density study. 
which was a tool to anticipate impacts and promote a discussion. And um, IBI group uh, is represented in this room and they really did a fine job on that project. We also did a design study and uh, we hired a, a, a student um, who now works for IBI group uh, to identify different building types and parking configurations in areas across the country that are similar to the streetcar neighborhood so that we can really understand how do buildings and parking, how do buildings and parking work understanding that there are single family residents nearby. That process was extremely illuminating and it helped us calibrate the form based code to um, identify building types that were not only compatible but that were feasible. We also did a traffic and parking study which was a tool to assess induced demand for vehicle trips and parking and the impact on adjacent residential streets. This study was very specific and the outcomes were a series of parking reductions that we put into the code that were tied to specific policies and um, actions on the part of developers. So it wasn't just a blanket reduction, hey, you're in a TOD, you get, a, you get an automatic parking rate reduction. A developer has to do specific things and those specific things were identified in the traffic and parking study. We also did a housing uh, market analysis that was prepared by um, Zions Bank Public Finance, and they did a great job at illustrating that um, the incipient market demand wasn't necessarily there, but by actually creating a place and creating quality design standards and linking it to the vision and to the streetcar corridor itself, you can actually create a market that didn't exist before. Um, with over 600 units that we have issued building permits for since the form based code was adopted, I'm pleased to say that um, the analysis of Zions Bank and other partners was perfectly apt. This is the density study that kind of started the whole process where we were able to identify, you know, the heights and densities um, along, the, uh, along the corridor. In the end, we removed the word density out of the code. The code does not talk about density at all. Instead, it is regulated by parking requirements, open space requirements, and the base building code requirements for habitable spaces. We didn't even talk about density. We, took, we, we even removed it off the table in our discussions with the neighborhoods because we felt that, that, that dialing it down to a number did not represent very well what the vision hoped to accomplish in the project and simply, frankly, got in the way. This is the design study that, um, uh, that Haley Pratt uh, helped us prepare. It was calibrated to the density study, so it respected the forms and, 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 and heights that were identified in the density study, where she actually identified building forms that could work in, um, in this neighborhood. Uh, crucially, uh, we also did a, um, an analysis of existing housing and building forms. And that allowed us to take a block by block look at where are the problems, where are the potential impacts against privacy on, on surrounding single family, um, single family homeowners. And that process, I can't tell you how, how instrumental that was in overcoming public opposition. Because then we were able to actually calibrate a form based code that treated this block differently than this block and this block recognizing that you know, every, every property has a different relationship with the properties behind it. We then adopted a master plan and um, we explored our compatibility in defining, and, and we defined possible building forms using those studies as precedent. Our outreach efforts for specifically the code adoption began in 2012. We held two neighborhood meetings, um, the first of which um, was a, a very difficult meeting um, because, again, it was a terrifying process for the neighbors to hear that all of these apartments were coming right next door and we have a history of really bad multifamily projects in our, our, in our, in our city. And our challenge as planners was to say, well, this time it's going to be different. And, of course, as we all know, we, 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 we give that message out to the community and their response is, uh, yeah, sure it is. So then we went back to kind of the drawing board and, and, and kind of figured out an approach to help um, mitigate this problem that we had with the residents. First off, recognizing that the issues with each block were different, and we used this plan to really illustrate that, uh, we held six different block meetings and got and kind of drilled down to the issues that were happening block by block. 
the truth is there were a handful of people in that meeting that made it go sideways, right? And so we pulled them out of it and said, all right, what are the issues that pertain specifically to your property? Because everybody does not, nobody wants to see their property values go down and everybody perceives these potential changes as a threat to their property values. So it was nice to be able to sit down with them individually and say, what specifically are you concerned about and how can we help, how can we help you uh, overcome it? And also, uh, we, used, uh, we, we hired an ombudsman who conducted door-to-door -door contact with everybody on, in the single-family neighborhoods surrounding our, our streets. That's something that the city paid for on its own, and that was huge um, because that helped establish trust anew between staff and the community. And we also provided regular updates to elected and appointed officials. If you're considering doing a form-based code, this is critically important. If your elected and appointed officials have no knowledge or, no, or, or limited familiarity with the form-based code, it's important to bring them on board well before, you, well before you write the staff report and say, hey, will you adopt this? Because they won't, unless they're familiar with it. Um, through the, uh, through, through the TLC grant, uh, we actually went from first, first draft to adoption in three to four months. Okay, think about that for a minute. And that's mostly because we did all of this advanced work ahead of time. And we held a final neighborhood meeting and where we re-invited re everybody. This was, not a six, this was not an individual block by block meeting. We, held, we, we sent it out to everybody within 300 feet of the zoning district boundaries and said, Come on by, let us know what you think. We had two people show up, and both of them liked the code. Isn't that amazing? That, you know, here we are saying, you know, we're going to put up to 600 units right next door, and everybody's like, yeah, I think it's a good idea. So the Planning Commission recommended <laughs> approval in one meeting, don't be jealous, and the City Council adopted the ordinance after two meetings. Nobody showed up to the City Council hearing. Okay, you can be a little jealous. Well, public outreach and input was extensive throughout the planning process. Very, pe very few people attended the formal hearings and meetings. And that's because, you know, again, don't use your public hearings as, 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 the, as, the, uh, as the formal way to solicit community input. If you're doing that, it's too late. It's important to kind of do all that up front. Um, this handy uh, flow chart was kind of influ influential in, in, in helping us move through the process pretty quickly. Um, essentially, the form-based code asks you to identify what type of place it is. Then you calibrate blocks and streets. You calibrate your sub-districts in the code, recognizing that every block has a different story. Then you look at uses and building types, open spaces, and additional requirements. And it's a very simple nine-step process that you can use to take that template form-based code and implement it for your community. Um, we have, and through that process, we identified two unique street types, um, the lane and the S-line corridor, which have a specific cross-section and street standard, and we use those street types as a way to buffer the, uh, the new density from, or the new uses from the surrounding uses. We also managed to identify an iconic sign in our community, that's the 80-foot bowling pin sign that you all know and love and we preserved it. Um, the form-based code is nimble in that sense where you can actually identify community icons and, 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 and adequately express a legislative intent that they be preserved because there's no way in anybody's signed ordinance that something like this could be approved today. Um, important to understand that most conditional uses can be approved by staff. Uh, residential uses However, remained as conditional uses, which were subject to planning commission approval. In our second form-based code for downtown, we made that a pure administrative approval. So now we can approve uh, units without density requirements at the staff level, simply because the city council and the planning commission have enough confidence in the design standards that are established in the code, they felt free letting that go. One of the things that we accomplished was that all new development would be subject to review by a design review committee prior to staff or planning commission approval. So we take the project proposal along with the design, design review committee report to the planning commission and uh, that helps speed up the process. The code includes guidelines and parameters for modifications and we found that heights, buffers, and transitions were the greatest challenges for neighbors and the form-based code through that nine-step process was very easy to come up with solutions specific to each block that helped resolve those. 
coding for the right types of open space was the greatest challenge for staff. Um, in other words, how do you make these spaces interface appropriately with the uh, streetcar line and the uh, Jordan River, I'm sorry, and the uh, Parley's Trail? And in the end, the council was most concerned about what was the appropriate parking ratio. And that's where that parking analysis came from. Um, I have to say that a strong vision is necessary for a form based code to be successful. The only reason why it went as quickly as it did is because we worked very hard in creating that very in creating that strong vision and that 's more than just a warm and fuzzy statement of "Wow, we love centers and corridors." That strong vision was actually uh, calibrated to the density study the market the market study, the housing study, and the traffic study. so we were actually able to tie that strong vision to specific achievable goals. Here's our regional context map. This kind of shows why South Salt Lake is doing what it's doing right now. It is at the nexus of um, all of our light rail and streetcar lines. Uh, it also has 500,000 vehicles a day passing by it on either I-80, I-15, or State Street, or 2100 South. Our future development includes 600 units along the streetcar corridor which is here. This is regulated under the streetcar design standards. I'm sorry, the streetcar form based code. We also have another 200 um, tax credit units that are going to be built uh, surrounding a uh, Winco grocer at State Street. And we recently rezoned this area, 200 acres, in a second form based code using the template. Uh, three projects that, are, that have already been permitted um, 32 townhome units at 4th East. We have 292 units uh, of housing at the 3rd East Station spanning a block. It's going to be a huge building. Um, <clears throat> we just got the uh, plan set yesterday. They were anxious to beat the deadlines for um, the new building code. <laughs> and uh, finally, and uh, my colleague Justin will be talking a little bit about this, are, are the Ritz Classic Apartment Homes, 287 units. They did preserve the sign, we're really happy to say. Um, we think that this form-based code has been, this template has been a great success. Um, it's helped resolve a lot of community resistance to, um, apart, uh, to multifamily, and you do that through quality design and conscientious placemaking. Thank you. Hi, nice to be here. So I'm, I'm here. Uh, as a result, I, th I find it interesting that 15 years ago, the Wasatch Front Regional Council started this visioning process. Three or so years ago, four years ago, South Salt Lake started their visioning process. And I'm at the end of this long row of planning and visioning and strategizing and thinking. And finally, here I am. I was the first one into the city of South Salt Lake that uh, this code is now being implemented with. So uh, the planning that's done by folks like you in this room, I mean, sometimes you might feel like, <laughs> what impact is this going to make? Does this really help? Um, or it's so far down the road that, you know, does it really matter? I mean, it, it makes a difference. And, and sometimes it takes a long time for your vision to, to come to fruition, but it, it can happen. So I was asked to speak on a, a developer's perspective. I, I want to clarify one thing. I'm actually no longer with ICO. Um, I went off on my own. So uh, I was director of acquisitions and development there and uh, was a developer on this project, but just wanted to get the record straight for the camera. So. Um, so a developer's perspective, uh, maybe you want to tune out. I, I mean, developers, you know, we're your, we're your clients. We are your enemies. Hopefully you, vis you view us as partners. Um, I've actually really grown to view that relationship with Frank at South Salt, Li Salt, South Salt Lake uh, more as a partnership because they've got this vision they want to implement, and I've got a project I want to help implement that vision. And it's actually a really collaborative process. So... Here's, here's my perspective. Uh, developers, we're always looking for deals. We're always keeping our eyes open. And w there's different uh, ways that we find deals. We, we network with other brokers. Um, we're always trying to get you know, top of mind when a, a new deal pops up on their radar. They'll call me first. 
other developers. I like to do joint venture partnerships. So I've got a great relationship with a number of developers and uh, we might come together, pool resources, pool expertise and do a project together. Um, end users, uh, if, if you have a relationship with you know, a sportsman's warehouse, I used to do site selection for them. So my developments were all, hey, I know exactly who I'm developing for. Now let's just go find the right sites for this developer. So that's one way you can uh, source development deals. You know who the end user is that's gonna come in to that site. Uh, to, to use the project you're going to develop. Um, you can do original sourcing. Uh, so again, this is my perspective, so I just wanted to give you a background on some of the sourcing, um, what, what sourcing can look like. Um, is anyone here from out of the Wasatch Front area? So there's a few of you. So um, as you go south of Salt Lake County, there's Utah County, and the north end of Utah County is just exploding right now. Um, you know, Utah is one of the fastest growing states in the country. Utah County is the fastest growing county in the country. And this area is the fastest growing area in Utah County. Okay. So, I mean, this is, this area is just exploding. So the Saratoga Springs is just on the Northwest side of Utah Lake. And my first day as a land acquisition guy, uh, a decade or over a decade ago, um, you know, my, my boss, my, the guy that hired me drove me out to the fields in Saratoga Springs, so this is uh, 2006. It's hard to see, I guess, with the lights, but that's a lot of farmland. I mean, this was just like, well, mink farms was mink farms kind of rule the area. There, there's still a lot of mink farms out there, but I mean, this was like alfalfa and mink country right here. And uh, today, it's it. <laughs> there's a lot more roads and it's a lot more built out. But they they drove me out here to this area. And, uh, you know, you can see all these fields, just a lot of farms. And they, they, they stopped right here on this road, pushed me out the door and said, hey, go find some land. And they laughed and drove away. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> OK. Um, so I did. I, I walked down the street. I started knocking on doors. And, and guys, like, there's no scale on this. But like one inch equals like 50 miles. So it was like 300 miles to the next house. And it was hot. So anyways, I'm out there knocking doors, walking a lot between. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> my first day, you know, a few hours into it, I called the boss. Hey, I got a guy that wants to sell some land. And I'm actually still working with that landowner today right down here. It's pretty cool. Um, so we're always looking for always looking for opportunities. I got one more fun story. Um, I did leasing for Phillips Edison and Company, and we had some shopping centers in Omaha, Nebraska. Anyone ever been to the booming metropolis of Omaha? Again, you can see there's a lot of farmland <laughs> between, you know, home and Omaha. And uh, we had this shopping center at the north end of town, and I had this, this chronically vacant space. Um, and they flew me out to the market, and they said, hey, go find a tenant, and, like, left me there alone. So I'm there in Omaha for, like, three days, and this is, like, January. Like, have you guys ever been to January, like, the Great Plains in the middle of winter? It is the coldest? Yes, you know. It's the worst experience. I mean, you think a Utah winter is cold? No. It's awful. So here I am. I'm out there knocking doors, and I'm literally, like... <laughs> I'm literally going to like, you know, this shopping center, this one, this one, that one, the other. I'm like, hey, come to my shopping center. It'd be so cool. And they're like, yeah, right. And I finally came down here. Like, I hit the whole city, like every door. And I finally found this cool group called the Donut Professor. And they were closed because it was nighttime. It was my last day there. And my goal was to pass out like 200 flyers. And I was at 198. And it was past my bedtime so I'm like I gotta get two more flyers out there before I turn in and there's this little strip center right there and you know one place was like a paint shop and they didn't want to move and then there's a donut shop and donut shops close at like noon right so I just wrote on the top hey I've got a space that would be really cool for you and I circled the picture on the flyer and I stuffed it under the door and the guy calls me the next day and says hey I'd love to talk and I got the deal done, so <laughs> there we go. That's, that's, those are some sourcing stories. So uh, point is, we're always looking for deals, and uh, as developers, leasing folks, sometimes you can get hungry and you can get aggressive and, and search far and wide for the next opportunity. 
Um, and one of those sources for deals, I believe, is cities. And that can come from a, a new road coming in. You learn that there's a new road going to be built. Well, guess what? Roads, you all know, I mean, that spurs development. I love looking for new intersections with major roads because, hey, there's an opportunity for a new development. So roads are a source. Um, just talking with city staff. I went and talked with Frank after I learned that they were doing this planning process and Frank actually said hey why don't you consider a couple of these sites so city staff you guys know your cities better than anyone I find it as a developer helpful and I hope that if a developer tries to set up an appointment you'll accommodate them um, because they're trying to implement your vision Uh, well they want to you know make money because we're all greedy developers Um, but they can help implement your vision and uh sit down and and Frank pointed me to a couple sites that were really uh, underutilized that I wouldn't have really necessarily recognized being not in the city every day. And then another source of opportunities, I believe, is when new code is implemented. And that's what happened here with South Salt Lake. A new form-based code was implemented across a wide swath of land, and it was an attractive code to me. And I said, hey, this this isn't implemented yet. If I move on this quick... I can be an early adopter. I can tie up some land knowing that it's going to be rezoned the way I need it to be rezoned for my project before my earnest money goes hard, and I'll be, you know, off to the races. So, and that's exactly what happened. I met with with Frank. We found some sites, and um, the code was on its way, and and I started started chasing it. So, the... I'm always looking for opportunities, and we're always trying to mitigate risk. And risk come, you know, economic factors like interest rates, stock and capital markets. You know, who could have predicted, you know, the Brexit? I mean, that could affect us potentially. We don't know what the impacts are going to be of that, if any, locally. But that actually could affect my business because capital markets might go crazy because of that. I mean, you saw what happened to the stock market. We don't still don't know what the fallout is, and that could scare the banks, and that could affect interest rates or lending standards, and then all of a sudden my projects don't happen because these national banks don't want to lend to local guys. So, I mean, it's it's we, we got to mitigate risk where we can. You know, who's <laughs> who knows what's going to happen with Donald or Hillary? I mean, that could affect us. We try to mitigate capital, um, debt and equity requirements. Higher leverage is higher risk, um, and sometimes higher returns, and sometimes you know bigger disasters if, if you miss 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 on your project. Um, design and construction, so you know getting to form. Design of your project can make or break your project. I mean, if you design it poorly, you, you, we had a project that thankfully we caught, but uh, we designed some multifamily units. The architect did. And we have a standard. You want your your bedrooms to be at least, this is our standard, you know, at least 10 feet by 10 feet um, in all directions uh, because that is the size that we need for to fit a, a, an appropriately sized bed, a dresser, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's our minimum standard. Well, that was drawn, and uh, this building, this project was in several buildings. So the first building goes up with framing, and in the framing stage, you know, as developers, we walk it, and we walk in, we're like, man, this room feels really small. We go back and look at the plans. It's dimensioned right, but we go back and measure it with a tape measure, and it's like seven or eight feet by ten feet. And we said, this this will never work. What happened? And the architect forgot to take out the closet and the dimensions. So we caught it early enough. You know, in the framing stage, we could fix it, and it you know, didn't kill the project. We had to lose a couple units to, you know, accommodate walls and whatnot, but... Design can kill a project, right? So we're trying to mitigate that risk. And then location. So here's here's an example. I'm chasing a deal right now in Buffalo, New York, right? Um, this is the competition right here, and this is my site. Well, this is Main Street. This is a subway station right here, and uh, I'm going to win on this one. You know, we're practically next-door neighbors, but you've got to go down a suburban street, go past a bunch of industrial and you're probably 300 yards uh, buried behind two-story single-family homes and industrial, and you have zero visibility. Whereas right next door, where I am, I've got 400, 500 feet of frontage on Main Street and location matters. I mean, there's there's a saying in retail, you know, 100 yards from success, that it matters. So we're, we're trying to mitigate risk from that perspective. And then let's get down to, you know, the crux of this meeting. 
entitlements and approvals. Um, that's a big risk for us as developers. We always we, we, we put contracts out. We have earnest money that's at risk. Uh, at some point, it's going to go hard. And I don't like to have earnest money go hard until I know what my entitlements are going to be because uh, entitlements are a political process. And, um, and, and that's something that we have to understand first. So um, after I learned of the new zoning effort in South Salt Lake City, uh, I met with the staff to learn more. And hey, I'll just read this. The new East Streetcar plan was instrumental in, in the decision to pursue opportunities. Uh, planning commission approvals, not city council. If you're city council, I love you. You play an important role in society and in your communities. I don't want to go in front of you for approvals. It's 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 a disaster. A lot, oftentimes, um, city councils are political. They are, frankly, oftentimes shopping for votes. Um, and it, it's you never know what you're going to get when you come out of a city council meeting. Um, you, you do your best to count the votes before you go in, but you don't know where it's going to come out sometimes. Um, so the fact that the approvals were at a planning commission level, planning commissioner, you know, they're appointed, they're less political, they're more concerned with the form and the style and the function of the project. I prefer that, you know, 100% of the time over going for before the city council. So if you're considering adopting a code and if you can do the work that Frank did at South Salt Lake and get the city council on board early, and remove them from the process because they've approved a form that they like, developers flock to that. We don't want to go to the city council if we don't have to. I, I can't tell you how big that is. Um, next item, form-based code, uh, limited height and parking and, and density was not discussed. I'm a big proponent. Have you guys ever seen Visioning Density? There's a website out there that's called Visioning Density. The Franklin Institute put together a book, and a lot of there's a lot of material out there. There's been a lot of tests, you know, um, quizzes done where people say which project is more dense, and it's you know a picture side by side, and groups such as you vote, and you're always wrong. You know, this 15 units per acre looks awful compared to this 45 units per acre because it was form. It was designed poorly, the 15 units. So, so the fact that Frank took density off of the table, I think, was a very smart move because um, most lay people don't understand density. They don't understand that density done well is great. Density done poorly is bad, and low density done poorly is bad. So that was a big deal for us that the city didn't say, hey, this, this is your density requirement. They let the height and the parking dictate how much we could get on the site. And then uh, flexible parking ratios. And then another big deal was that the land use authority, so the staff, had the ability to grant modifications to the code. There are a few items that didn't really work on our project with the code such as uh, they require the, the, the form-based code required four-inch setbacks for the windows. They had to be pushed into the building four inches. Well, if I've got a six-inch um, wall, exterior wall, and the windows have to be set back four inches, and the windows themselves are four inches, that doesn't work with framing and structure. And the city staff was able to approve, say, okay, you're right, that doesn't really work on this building because you're You've got a six inch wall, not a 12 inch or eight inch wall. So they allowed us to have the windows flush with the outside. Another issue, um, we're a uh, podium project. So it's first level parking with four stories of wood on top. And uh, there's a lot of weight coming down on the podium. And they had a, a requirement for transparency and number of openings along 200 East. Well, for structural purposes and shear, um, I couldn't have as many openings as was required per the code. And the staff recognized that, you know, safety is important and they wanted the project and we would have to have modified the project significantly if we were going to meet this um, requirement and they allowed a variance because of that. Another issue was balconies. Um, they required a five foot, was it five foot by eight foot or, some, or six foot by eight foot? Right. That's a big balcony. So when you get past three feet about, you actually have to have structural support for the balcony. And um, fitting within the building envelope that we had, we couldn't afford six feet on one side and six feet on another side, 12 feet 
of building envelope being taken up. So they allowed us to modify it with um, some Juliet or smaller balconies because our open space was just off the charts. The requirement was 20% open space. You were at 38. I'm at 38% open space. Now, how can I do that at 70 units per acre? 38% open space. I have two plazas on top of the parking podium that are over the size of a football field. How many multifamily projects in your city have two football fields worth of open space programmed into, your, into their projects? Again, density done well is great. Density done poorly is not great. Um, here, I'll, I'll move on. We're running out of time. Uh, here's some pictures. So here's uh, State, State Street is over here. This is 200 East over here. This is the S-Line corridor. Uh, see, this is an M shape. So it's three wings. And these are the two football-sized field, football -sized, uh, field -sized, uh, open spaces right here. And it's programmed with you know swimming pools and dog parks and bocce ball courts and hot tubs and barbecue pits and picnic areas and you know first class fitness facility you know these are the kind of neighbors you know the rents on this project are going to be more than the mortgages the folks living in single family homes are paying these are the kind of people you want to attract to your city and the, the residents got that, that this wasn't going to be a slumlord multifamily project. This is going to be nice, class A, really, really nice stuff. Um, here's a picture of it. We have a motif of a bowling ball here. If you guys remember, this was the old Ritz Classic uh, bowling alley site. It's sadly no longer standing. Um, not really sad. Um, <laughs> So here's the bowling bowling ball. We we actually got calls from people after we demoed it saying, "Hey, where's my bowling ball?" Like, <laughs> if you didn't take it out, you know, last time you went bowling, we're sorry. Um, here's a view from the north uh, east. Uh, we programmed a plaza area for uh, like a cafe, um, internet cafe type space here. How it interacts with the S line. We have to put in this. Uh, crushed gravel tra walking trail along the S-Line corridor. Here's from the northwest side. Again, look at, the, look at the bottom. This is a parking structure. Form, base code, can protect the property values of your neighbors. This doesn't look ugly as far as a parking structure goes. I mean, you can't really tell because it's got windows, it's got glass, and uh, we think our architect did a great job making that bottom level look like it's living space. Um, and then here's everyone's favorite. Um, as, as Frank said, the, the public didn't come out to fight the project. At our neighborhood session, we had two people come, three people come, and um, they all liked the project. They didn't have a problem with it. But I got national recognition because we might be tearing down, you know, evil developer ruining um, Americana icon is what the blog post said. Um, th there are people in their spare time, they track things like bowling pin signs in Utah when they live in Boston. And uh, they care that a developer in Utah might ruin a, an Americana icon. So, hey, you know what? We all have our hobbies. Um, we are keeping the sign, and uh, we're going to bring it to the 21st century with LED, efficient lighting instead of incandescent, okay? And uh, it's going to be beautiful and retain the same look and feel. And uh, there you go. I guess in summary, um, I'm here because planners and folks like you implemented a vision a decade or more ago when I was in junior high school. <laughs> and uh, here we are today with, uh, you know, the rubber hitting the road with not just my project, but a plethora of projects coming because someone had a vision and had the guts to implement it uh, instead of waiting for a developer to come with an idea. So thank you.
So uh, thanks, everybody. I know we're over time, so um, go eat lunch if you want, but we'll hang out here for a few minutes if you have any questions. Yeah. We did submit for an award. You did not give it to us. Well, <laughs> my own company didn't win one either, but let's chat. All right. So, uh, yeah, to, to, to answer your other question, we did consult with developers, including, um, including Justin, as we drafted the code. We ran ideas by them um, repeatedly. Um, and, and, again, we did a lot of precedent work in, in trying to understand, you know, how uh, developer standards and building forms intersected in our other coding efforts, and we inherited that process, but yeah, we did. You can tell with the results. It just so often missed, and you got pretty pictures, and they'll always remain pictures, so good job. Thank you.